Dayville Road disposal site in Valdez is overflowing with bags of toxic oily waste gathered from Alaska's contaminated shoreline. Some burnable debris is disposed of here in small incinerators. The rest is transported to Alaska's North Slope or shipped to a disposal plant in Oregon. But the incinerators can't keep up with the demand, and mounting piles of toxic material have meant mounting headaches for Exxon. The company applied for permits to operate several large incinerator barges, but state officials have been reluctant to issue them until they are satisfied the floating incinerators will meet certain emission standards. At the present time, we're not real impressed with the equipment that they've sent up here because we don't feel it's the best available. And uh, we're in the process with EPA of developing performance criteria that those incinerators are going to have to, to meet before we would uh, issue any permits. The Dayville Road incinerators appear to be burning cleanly, but questions have been raised concerning their unseen toxic emissions. The state has not required the site to have a permit, but bigger incinerators burning tons more waste will require public review. Wastes are being burned throughout the country, so there is technology available to, to burn these wastes properly, and we want to make sure that, that we have that, that same technology up here uh, for the protections of the citizens of the state of Alaska. Exxon asked the state to process the applications without public comment, but DEC officials insist on public hearings, saying that concern over air pollution is too great. Those public hearings begin next week in five Alaska cities and will play a significant role in deciding the fate of Exxon's proposed incinerator barges. Meanwhile, for workers at Dayville Road, the spill won't be over until the waste is gone. Nestled in the inlets and coves of Prince William Sound, cleanup crews labor to wash contaminated beaches. High pressure hoses and mops help to remove surface oil, but tidal action and shifting sands cause deposits below the surface to re-oil beaches that have been previously treated. This beach on Green Island is one of the areas worked on most recently by cleanup crews, yet there is little difference between it and this untreated beach nearby. Exxon has announced plans to discontinue cleanup operations and begin pulling out September 15th. The Coast Guard, which is overseeing the cleanup, asked the company to submit a plan for demobilization, but state environmental officials feel the work is just starting. I've written to Admiral Yost of the U.S. Coast Guard asking his help in making sure that Exxon sticks with the shoreline oil removal operation and the effort to get the oil out of the water. We need to make sure that that effort continues as long as weather conditions and safety considerations allow. The state of Alaska is seeking Admiral Yost's assistance in obtaining a commitment from Exxon to maintain their presence in the spill area during the winter. In addition, they ask that an emergency strike force be retained to intercept oil slicks that threaten hatcheries or other sensitive areas, and that full-scale cleanup operations be resumed in the spring. It's really important to get this job done right, and the only way to do that is to stick with it as long as possible this fall, do a thorough job of maintaining the progress, over the winter and planning for an early startup in the spring. Exxon declined to comment on their scheduled September pullout, so for now, the answer to how clean is a clean beach has yet to be determined. When the oil tanker Flying Clipper approached the Nikiski refining terminal on the Kenai Peninsula in Cook Inlet, it was met by some 20 fishing vessels that had formed a blockade refusing its entry into port. The fishermen, calling themselves frustrated independent salmon harvesters, or fish, are trying to create pressure on oil companies in hopes of getting a serious oil cleanup effort in Cook Inlet underway. The group's fishing season was officially closed last week due to oil from the Exxon Valdez. Two years ago, it was the same story when a smaller oil spill in Cook Inlet ruined their season, depriving them of a living. As the tanker approached the blockade, the captain radioed the Coast Guard asking for instructions what to do. Okay, I've got a maneuver uh, to keep from hitting these docks, and uh, if I have a choice, it'll be either the boat or the dock. Yeah, well, I understand that. Uh, people have been warned they're, they're playing chicken with you now is the best way to put it. Uh, go ahead and proceed slowly and uh, plan on a tie-up. When the people that own these oil companies can stand on the dock 
and tell a pilot or a skipper of a huge boat like the Flying Clipper tonight, just keep going regardless of the people in front of it, just run over them. He didn't say run over them, but he said just keep it coming. So what's the difference? I mean, three seconds and he would have killed four people tonight. Nikiski, located some 300 miles from where the Exxon Valdez went aground, is outside of the area Exxon has said it is willing to clean up. Therefore, very little is being done to handle the massive volume of oil that has polluted Cook Inlet. It hit the beaches and now it's sneaking around here. It's like a black, slimy evil. It's affecting more and more lives all the way and Exxon is gonna to have to pay the piper. I don't see him talking to anyone. I don't see him interviewing anyone. I don't see him visiting anyone to find out how much harm they have done. And it's, it's, it's disgusting. They've less left us up in the air as far as any other work we can do. I can't, as far as I know to this date, go to the shoe store and sell shoes because they want to mitigate that money that I make and take it off of the compensation that they're offering me. I can't work for fishing and I can't work other than fishing. We need the state's backing. We need the backing of the Congress of the United States and the American people as well. The fishermen of this region are not only concerned about this year's lost fishing season, but about future closures due to inadequate oil cleanup abilities. And they're at their wit's end. And we just feel it's time to push back. The oil companies have pushed us in the corner. We got no place to go. We're broke. If somebody takes your livelihood away from you, you just have to fight. And I, and I don't know how to fight. I mean, this is the only way I knew how to do it. The village of English Bay is perched on the tip of the Kenai Peninsula, 200 miles south of Valdez. It's one of several communities whose main sources of food are fishing and subsistence gathering, activities that have been curtailed since the oil spill. Although Exxon has supplied canned food, much of it is going unused because it's not the food that residents traditionally eat. It really hurts everybody here. All them uh, smoke houses are empty here. All seem comes right into the uh, lagoon entrance over there, and uh, you know we do pick a lot of uh, seafoods down there. We don't trust them now. We don't want to take a chance. Elderly people, you know, sometimes you go up to them and they'd be angry. You know, they want their uh, their uh, native food back. You know, they don't want that money, and sometimes it's hard to talk to them. You know. 450 miles away in southeast Alaska, Angoon residents, untouched by the spill, have launched a major effort to gather 10,000 pounds of subsistence food for shipment to oiled villages. The Sea Team Project, sponsored by the State Department of Community and Regional Affairs, Exxon, the City of Angoon, and the Clinkett Haida Regional Indian Council, is a summer youth employment program. Village elders instruct their young people in the traditional ways of subsistence gathering, hunting, and fishing. Some people are really devastated, you know, more so than other people are, and I'm just glad it never happened to us. And I feel pretty good about it. I'm getting paid really well for it, but, you know, I think if it really came down to it, I'd do it anyway for not any money. One of the major importances of the food is that I think it, it's a shared cultural heritage that uh, the native villages in Alaska, uh, subsistence people in general, uh, gather food from the land. Uh, although these are different tribes in the different villages, we have different tribes here and, and there are different tribes in those villages, it gives us that we have a shared responsibility, I think, and a shared stake in the spill, and I think this reflects it. Lack of subsistence food could be dangerous. Psychologists believe there's potential for serious depression in those villages hit by the spill, due in part to vitamin deficiencies resulting from a dramatic change in diet and the lack of cultural activities revolving around subsistence food gathering and preparation. It's a loss of a way of life. It's hard for people to understand that. They think that we have a choice between uh, the foods that we gather and prepare or going to the store. That isn't so. I think we prefer the foods that we gather and prepare, only because of the social activity, our way of life, the way we interact with each other. If you take that away, they can never go out and buy what they've lost.
Snug Harbor on Knight Island in Prince William Sound suffered a direct hit from the Exxon Valdez oil. Despite the best efforts of cleanup workers, the beaches on Knight Island remain black and sticky. There's renewed hope, though, in a process called bioremediation. We're just encouraging Mother Nature what it would normally have done over a longer period of time. So at the end of uh, either this season or sometime in the spring, we'll have to come back and assess how clean that beach is and what type of treatment process should now be done to it, if any. Environmental Protection Agency scientists are on site in Valdez analyzing the results of bioremediation applications thus far. Essentially, bioremediation uses fertilizer to stimulate the appetite of bacteria present in Prince William Sound. That bacteria then goes to work dispersing the oil by breaking down its molecular structure. The initial results are encouraging. Bioremediation was used on this strip of Snug Harbor Beach in June, and two weeks later, the rocks on the surface were virtually free of oil. You want to walk down the beach about half a mile here, you can see a section of the beach we sprayed earlier in the week, and you can see the visible results. It's here already. It's been less than a week. So as far as I could tell, it's working. EPA Chief William Riley was visibly moved by what he saw. It, uh, it was a wholly different experience to come back here now and see something beginning to work to deal with this really horrible problem. I think it's uh, encouraging. It's some of the real good news that's coming out of Prince William Sound. Exxon officials are quick to caution that bioremediation isn't a cure-all when it comes to oil removal. Conventional methods are still required. Bioremediation is not the, uh, the panacea to all the problems with oil impacted areas. Bioremediation ought to be looked at as another tool in the grab bag. Uh, there are a number of tools that we use for shoreline cleaning ranging from manual, hot water mechanical, cold water flushing, and bioremediation. Uh, it's an important tool because uh, it doesn't take a lot of physical effort to apply to the shoreline. And uh, important too because what it's doing is taking a natural process and speeding it up. We're just helping Mother Nature along. Bioremediation requires wave and tidal agitation to mix the fertilizer with the bacteria. The challenge facing cleanup experts is how to make the process work in the calm waters of the many sheltered bays and lagoons of Prince William Sound. Terence O'Malley in Juneau, Alaska. Had there been no Exxon Valdez oil spill, the world may never have known Corexit. Corexit is similar to kerosene, but without the smell. Exxon developed Corexit in direct response to the Exxon Valdez disaster. It's been formulated uh, to meet a couple of objectives. One is low toxicity, so it won't be harmful to uh, the ecology. And the other is to minimize dispersion, meaning breaking the oil up into tiny droplets. Uh, the objective is to um, have the oil uh, mobilized down the shoreline to the uh, intertidal zone and then uh, float on top of the water and then be picked up by skimmers. Corexit is being tested along the shoreline of four islands in Prince William Sound. Workers spray the beaches with Corexit and then wait about 15 minutes. They then hose the beach down, allowing the oil to float out into the water, and from there, skimmers scoop it up. The uh, coated oil off of the rock, the oil has become very weathered now, and, and, and the normal process of cleaning the surfaces, we're spending quite a bit of time pounding it with hot water and high-pressure hoses, and this is an attempt to see if a more passive approach, like chemically relieving it, would allow less time on the beach as well as more improved oil recovery. Corexit is the latest in a long line of creative ideas to remove oil from Prince William Sound beaches. A concerned homemaker wrote Alaska's governor recommending vinegar and water, and one gentleman suggested deploying flamethrowers. According to Exxon, though, Corexit works. This is a rock off the beach that we just treated. This is the top part that was sprayed with the Corexit 9580 and that was then sprayed with the, the warm water wash, and that's the bottom of the rock. The bottom and the top looked alike. Lab results on the effectiveness and how environmentally safe Corexit is are still pending. The Coast Guard, along with state officials, are expected to make a final decision on the widespread usage of Corexit by early next week. Terence O'Malley in Juneau, Alaska.
Just outside of Homer at Mars Cove, 200 miles away from where the Exxon Valdez ran aground, a cleanup crew works diligently to restore this beach to its natural state. The Homer Area Recovery Coalition, or HARC, is coordinating the effort. HARC is operating under a $100,000 grant from the state of Alaska, which is encouraging its citizens to devise new ways to clean beaches without harming the environment. While Exxon has set its own standards for beach cleanliness, HARC workers seek to establish higher standards. We feel that it's important that somebody else goes out there and tries to set some different standards, ho hopefully better standards. The days, there were some days where we had 12 people on a beach and uh, Exxon had 12 people on a beach. We recovered five times as much oil as they did. Hark maintains that Exxon's hot water method of hosing beaches only washes the tops of the rocks, leaving oil below the surface of the beach untouched. These deposits then rise to the surface, re-oiling already treated beaches. What we hope to do is clean the, the, all the oil from the beach. We, have, we do not want to treat a beach. We don't, we don't accept that word. It's not, it's not in our vocabulary. We want to clean the whole beach. At Morris Cove, the beach has been divided into sections. The entire top layer of each section is removed and placed into a homemade rock washing machine. The rocks and gravel are then sprayed on both sides with pressurized hot water. The resulting mixture of oily water flows into a separator tank. There, the oil floats to the surface where it's skimmed off and collected in buckets for disposal. The clean rocks are then returned to the same section of beach from where they were removed. Park began as a wildlife recovery operation during the early days of the spill, but has since attracted concerned volunteers from all over the world who simply want to help clean up oily beaches. I use mostly a car in Switzerland. I use also a car here in the United States. And I think in this kind I'm also responsible for this disaster. I feel like I'm just helping Mother Earth clean herself. Um, I'm Earth too, I'm Mother Earth too, so when I help physically clean with my hands, it just seemed to be the only thing I could be doing with my life right now. I'm not really an industry basher, I'm more of a type of person that likes to get people to really care and, and love the Earth more, and that's what I'm here for. Just trying to take care of a little beach one step at a time. While volunteer labor and low-tech oil removal solutions may result in cleaner beaches at Mars Cove, the fate of hundreds of miles of Alaska's coastline still stained with oil remains uncertain. This is Terrence O'Malley reporting from Juneau, Alaska. When the Exxon Valdez started gushing 260,000 barrels of oil, no one could have predicted its slick would eventually extend some 600 miles, way beyond Prince William Sound. Likewise, no one could have predicted its devastation on wildlife, especially birds. We know that this spill has killed more birds than any other oil spill in the history of oil transportation. To date, there are four semi-trailers full of dead birds. They're kept refrigerated and will eventually be used as evidence during litigation. 74 species of birds have been hit by the oil spill. The Fish and Wildlife Service has documented more than 31,000 dead birds, which they say represents just between 10 and 30 percent of the total number, meaning that as many as 270,000 birds were probably killed. It's expected to take up to 70 years for the bird populations to totally recover in spill areas. Sea otters have proven to be the most susceptible marine mammal to the oil. Otters that get exposed to that oil, they have to do constant grooming and oil could be either absorbed through the skin, but a lot of it was ingested. When they were defecating, they'd be defecating early on, just it looked like crude oil, just passing right through. Thus far, there are 966 documented sea otter deaths out of an estimated 3,000 otters inhabiting the spill area in the sound. Biologists can't say for sure how long it will take for the otter population to recover. 137 bald eagle deaths can be attributed to the oil spill. Eagles mate for life, and there are about 2,000 pairs in Prince William Sound. 
Of those, this summer, 65% have experienced what is known as egg failure, the inability to produce offspring. The eggs of bald eagles are extremely susceptible to even small amounts of oil. When an adult returns back to the nest that has a little bit of feathers that have oil on it, just a little bit of that oil on the feathers, when they sit, sit back on the nest, it would kill the egg, and then that would be considered egg failure because the, the fetus inside would die. An Eagle Rehabilitation Center has been established in Anchorage to take care of oil-sick bald eagles. There, volunteers work with the eagles to prepare them for their return to the wild or to be placed somewhere in captivity for life. Even then, though, not all of them will make it. The problem with eagles is the males tend to be more spirited. We do have one that we were trying to work with, and his spirit is just so wild that, uh, unfortunately, I don't think we'll be able to tame him at all or even get him so that he's tolerant of people. Biologists predict that the oil will continue to take its toll on wildlife. So long as there is oil on beaches, they say, there will be animals dying from it. Terrence O'Malley reporting from Juneau, Alaska. Following the grounding of the Exxon Valdez, the immediate effects of the spill on the geography and wildlife in Prince William Sound were evident. But only now, more than five months later, is the toll on the human population becoming known. As the slick grew, so too did the alarming statistics. A recent survey by the Alaska Department of Health and Social Services shows that those communities with substance abuse programs have seen admissions double since the spill. In Cordova, for instance, mental health referrals are up 28 percent. In Kodiak, up 50 percent. In Homer, where domestic violence has increased 1,000 percent, city officials, health care professionals, and residents are coping with a disaster that doesn't seem to end. You don't know if the fishermen are going to be fishing. You don't know what the economy is going to do. You don't know what property values are going to do. You don't know whether more oil is going to come into the bay. And in the month of July so far, we've had a 114 percent increase in our referrals. I believe that that has to do with the oil spill, with uncertainty, with unemployment. Our crimes of violence have increased substantially. It's uh, not only assaults and things of that nature, we're having a lot more uh, domestic disputes, we're having a lot more bar fights. People just don't realize what it's like to have your whole livelihood jeopardized, not just one year, but maybe the next five years. I haven't gone down to the beaches, I haven't gone down to look because I have to keep it together to deal with people here in the agency, and that's hard. Emotionally, it's been a real travesty. I've had a recurring nightmare since the end of April, since the first time I sat down on a beach and had oil up to my knees. I haven't slept more than four hours in any one night for the last four months. This is the third largest man-made disaster outside of wartime in the entire history of the human race. This is surpassed outside of wartime only by Bhopal and Chernobyl. This is going to have some very, very long-term scars on the people that live here. The state of Alaska has developed a strike force of mental health and family counseling workers that will be in the field most of this winter. The lesson for other states in preparing for a disaster of this kind is to do a considerable amount of contingency planning for humans as well as wildlife and the environment. Terrence O'Malley reporting from Juneau, Alaska.
they're talking about demobilization and pulling out from the cleanup, and everyone's attention is focused on the beach cleanup. And there's so much more to it than that. A large part of the problem is cleanup of state and federal legislation to prevent something like this from ever happening again. So we need to refocus people's attention on what's really going to be effective in preventing something like this from happening again. It's unusual because this is the only state in the nation that allows foreign flag supertankers to carry oil from one of its ports. This tanker today specifically is Liberian registered, Italian crude, and I'm sorry, Israeli registered, Liberian flagged, and Italian crude. So if this tanker or one of the other foreign flag supertankers hits Bly Reef or has a tanker spill, who would pay? It would just be an incredible legal snarl. I mean, we would have attorneys, um, well, we, we would just be enmeshed in this legal nightmare, and I don't know. Meanwhile, oil would be spilling everywhere. We're hoping that Congress makes industry responsible for any and all risks associated with marine transport of oil. If they want to bring in foreign flag tankers, that's fine, but post a bond. Be financial, have the financial resources to deal with a spill up front. I mean, we want to know where that money's going to come from, and we want the oil industry to assume the risks. It's their game. This community finally is having fun again. It's something we almost forgot how to do. And we sat there stuffing rocks from a treated beach that's been pronounced clean um, in 650 Ziploc bags, which we're mailing out to our all congressmen.